Hey guys, welcome to another potentially award-winning podcast by Yes Users with huge emphasis on the word potential. In today's episode, we have an extraordinary guest with us, Shayag Majumdar. Saying that Shayag wears many hats would be an understatement. He is CEO and CTO of a deep tech startup, an ex-Indian Navy officer, an INSEAD MBA. He has been an MD at Rocket Internet as well. His expertise spans international business, global e-commerce, supply chain, and artificial intelligence. So let's dive into Shaikh's journey. Shaikh, thanks a lot for coming on this podcast. We have heard so much about you and the amazing work you are doing. Even though we share a prior connection, but that was not the sole reason I approached you. I was amazed by the work that you are doing. So, people who don't know anything about you, can you give them a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. So, I started my career back in 2003 with the Indian Navy. I qualified for IIT and NDA at the same time. I decided to go for the NDA. I served for 10 years in the Navy. I was one of the youngest top officers in the history of the Navy. I also was a nuclear, biological, chemical warfare specialist, a helicopter operator, etc. Did all that and then left the Navy in 2012. Started a few hotels and restaurants by the beach in Goa. And uh, very quickly, they climbed to rank number one, rank number eight on TripAdvisor in all of Goa, which was a fabulous growth in a very short time. After some time, I felt that I wanted to do something else. So I took a month break, gave my GMAT, got a good score, got into INSEAD. You know, INSEAD was a big change in my life. These are all step functions. Navy was a huge character change because before Navy, I was this nerdy, geeky guy who was all into academics. Navy made me a lot more hardcore. Post Navy, I did business on the streets, which made me a lot more savvy because, you know, running a hotel by the beach in Goa is not a cakewalk. There are all sorts of problems which I'll not get into. And then INSEAD came and introduced me to a global audience, a different level of sophistication in terms of thinking, in terms of knowledge, which I never had been exposed to. And INSEAD was also life-changing in many ways because 150 companies rejected me. I realized getting a good GMAT score or being an officer in the Navy doesn't qualify you to get a job anywhere. And so I had to kind of mold myself in a different way. INSEAD didn't give me scholarship to begin with, so I didn't have the money to pay beyond the first two months. So I was the only candidate in all of INSEAD who in the first month decided to leave INSEAD. And then the dean came and said, I'm going to offer you a scholarship so that you stay. And so they offered me a special scholarship. So all these, right? And then post INSEAD, I joined Rocket Internet, where I was uh, the global head of commerce, cross-border commerce. And I set up the offices in Africa, LATAM, South Asia, China. Once again, a massive step function. I had no idea about any of these geographies. So I'd land up in a country. The country manager would help me. I would recruit a team. I would set up the pipelines. I'd set up the supply chain, the payment processes, learn the legalities, learn how each country worked. And in one year, I grew the business to roughly about $100 million in revenue. It was massive growth. Wow. And of course, no, 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 no credit to me. Rocket already had an existing pipeline. So Rocket mm-hmm. had massive marketplaces. So growing that wasn't the difficult thing. Creating the pipelines was. And then after that, I decided to start my own business. So I ended up in small dormitory in Hyderabad, where I started my startup, almost suffocated to death from carbon monoxide poisoning. And then one day got electrocuted because the water leaked. So all sorts of stuff, early stage startups, didn't have any money. So, uh, you know, took a personal loan, which almost bankrupt me, got the business started, realized I couldn't do it out of India because of regulations, expanded it to Singapore. Then when we launched, two weeks after that, lockdown happened. And uh, we had in two weeks, nine customers. And after that, we had to shut it down. So I went to Middle East, which was one of the only geographies not locked down. And I closed a customer for half a million dollars. Yeah, single sale, half a million dollars. Saved my company, went and showed that to the investors. Got a good amount of funding, about a million dollars. And then uh, decided that, uh, you know, the best market would be U.S., so in 2021, US was not yet allowing Indians. I went to Mexico, spent a few weeks there, managed to get into US and got to Los Angeles, got into Techstars, established a company in the US, got funded in the US and started building the company in the US, got some customers, US market crashed. And uh, in the middle of all that, I managed to get term sheets and almost got a funding. And two days before my funding was supposed to come, Silicon Valley Bank crashed and the term sheet evaporated. So I was forced to come back to India. So I came back to India. I was like at the end of my tether. I had uh, tried everything for seven years, God knows what all. 
I've only told you like less than, I don't know, less than a percentage of my stories. But somehow in all of this, I'd learned a lot. So I was applying for jobs. I was getting a couple of offers in the US in spite of the bad market. But some of the companies I'd reached out to came back to me and said, hey, you know, we want to build that ONDC stack you were talking about. Why don't you come and join us? And I went back to my family and I said, against everybody's wishes, I'm starting a new company. And uh, nobody was a fan of that. <laughs> but I went and I started a new company. That was May 2023. My wife was super upset. My parents, they don't know how to be, react to my decisions because they're Bengali yeah. parents, risk averse. And I left the Navy to do a hotel in Goa. They were pissed with that. I left that, which was making money to do an MBA in France. They were not very happy with it. I left a very well-paying job to come back to a dormitory in Hyderabad to start a business. They did not like it. And then when I came back and I was trying to get a job and I started a new company again, they just didn't know how to react. They were like, okay, we have given up on you. You're 38 and if you've still not learned your lesson, I don't know when you will. It was kind of that. And uh, I went back to my employees from my earlier company and I said, look, I'm starting a new company. I've not paid you in four months. I don't know when I'll pay you. If you guys won't feel like coming and joining again, please do. And 30 of them said, till the time our families kick us out, we are there. So they came and joined. So I had a team, which I wasn't paying. And the one rule I had was no weekends, no vacation, no holidays, no sick leave, no nothing. Not until we launch. So three and a half months, nobody took a leave. We worked like maniacs, launched our product. Uh, it takes 12 months to launch a product on ONDC. We did it in three months. And uh, nine months later, we have 20 large enterprise contracts, including Coca-Cola, HUL, Canada Bank, Aditya Bella. I can keep going. We have five massive GTM partners, Microsoft, Google, Meta, NVIDIA, HSBC, Yes Bank. They're selling our product. We have just received a million dollars in funding plus without actually going and making any effort for fundraise. Things turn Congratulations for that. Congratulations for that. You you are one of the lucky few, especially how the funding market is going right now because I'm in the same market. Trust me, I know. I didn't try to raise funds. I was just basically telling investors I don't have the money and in three months I'll shut down. But right. I have clients. And investors who refused me in July came back in February and invested. By the way, I do want to mention one man, Hari Balasubramaniam, Hari B. In my earlier company, I was pitching at Tycon and uh, Padmaja ma'am from Indian Angel Network and Vikram from Ivy Cap said, uh, we'll invest if you're able to restructure your company. So later on, when I started the new company, I reached out to IN and Ivy Cap. IN said, we will invest. So Rajneesh was the partner. So Rajneesh said, go meet Hari in Bangalore. That one fateful meeting in a Starbucks in Bangalore for two hours, Hari was basically, he bought me coffee, bought me a muffin and he said, tell me a story. And I told him my story. I said what I'm trying to do. And very surprisingly, he knew everything about ONDC. He had already done sessions on ONDC. So he came and told me, I believe in you. I will make your round happen. I will get everything done. You go do your business. And he did. He brought other investors together. My round was oversubscribed in iron in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, we had 3.75 CR. So 4.5 CR. But yeah. the commitment was they could only give us 3.75. So they had to say no to the investors who came after 3.75. And so they had to shut the deal down in 10 minutes. And then Harry went and spoke to a couple of other major investors and said, this guy's doing something good. I believe in him. You should look. And so they came. Look, people come along the way. They guide you. They help you. I think in my earlier company, it didn't succeed because of me. And this company is succeeding because of me. Not hubris. It's just the truth. The earlier company didn't succeed because of me because I just didn't know how to sell very well. I just didn't know how to build the tech very well. And along the way, I made all those mistakes and learned. And this company is paying the compounded dividends because I'm the CEO, I'm the CTO, I'm the single sales guy. I've closed 20 large contracts in six months. And uh, yesterday I was talking to the CGM of Canada Bank and he said this thing. He said, uh, Shaikh, the only reason we bought from you, we are a PSU bank. We have never given anybody a contract in one month. We gave you a contract in one month. And the only reason we bought from you is when we spoke to you, the way you explained it to us, yeah. we were sure it is going to be a big thing and we trusted you. So this has come back again and again. The ability to be transparent, the ability to be able to communicate your vision and align it with people who want to do it and knowing who to work with. Because we said no to so many customers. We've said no to, I won't name, but we said no to some Fortune 500 companies in the last six months. And it's not easy as a startup that isn't funded and is struggling to pay salaries to say no to a Fortune 500 company. And the reason I learned that in my earlier company is don't say yes to everything. Don't keep doing what everybody wants you to do. Even if that means short-term gains, don't do it. 
So all these things, I think, compounded the uh, benefits of the earlier company failing is paying off here. Wow. You know, you are one of the very few people who when said yes to coming on the podcast, I was just baffled as to how I'm going to structure it. Because there's so much material that you know we talk to. But after this introduction, I want to give a little bit of context to our listeners. So please explain what Adya is doing, what problem it is solving and what kind of customers you have. Okay, so the first thing I need to explain to you is what is ONDC and then I'll explain to you what Adya does, etc. See, most people and the media is explaining ONDC like it's another platform. There are two things in the world of technology, platforms and protocols. Of course, there are applications, but applications are built on platforms. But in the world of technology, there are protocols and platforms. So if you think about it, the internet is a protocol. The internet, you yeah. do not use the internet directly. In order to use the internet, you need a browser. Yeah, And if somebody has to sell something, they need an app or they need a website. So the browser connects you to the website. Over time, the US government decided that the way for them to monopolize the internet yeah. was to create platforms. So platform as a strategy came up during yeah. the late 80s. And this is historically documented. I'm not making this up. Platform as a strategy came up in the late 80s with the advent of Windows, with the advent of Apple, and later Amazon, Google, Meta. You know, these massive platforms have come up as a way of extending U.S. soft power to the rest of the world. Because you can't extend hard power anymore post the 70s. The world is so well connected that you can't extend hard power. It's very difficult to do that. But you can extend soft power. Economic wars can be fought. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is through extending platforms on which every country is dependent. Think of it. What is the market cap of Apple? $3 trillion. Yeah. How many countries have a GDP of $3 trillion? <laughs> I don't know, but very few. My guess is very few. Yeah, there are only seven countries with a market cap of $3 trillion. So the point is, these were created on purpose. And then different geographies like China tried to prevent it from happening. China said, we will create our own platforms. Europe said, we will regulate it. The only country who has done something very, very intelligent about this is India. Okay. What India did is India created its own set of protocols. So the first protocol that came up was obviously Aadhaar. So when we think of DPGs, we don't realize this. This is a little intellectual stimulation or academic in nature. But understand this because the rest will become easier. When you think of DPGs or digital public goods that India has been trying to launch, this is basically, you know, post-independence, we did PSUs, public sector undertakings. Now we are doing DPGs because the country has matured to the point where you don't need PSUs anymore. You need DPGs now to connect everybody and create an equal playing field. Otherwise, platforms will monopolize the market. Platforms always monopolize the market, by the way. Which browser are you on? Chrome. Uh, yeah. I don't use Chrome. I'm a big fan of Edge, actually. But I'm an outlier. I'm 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 in You're the minority. Outlier. Yes. Which uh, platform do you use for shopping? Amazon. Which one do you use for food? Swiggy or Zomato. These yeah. three platforms monopolize the market always, <laughs> even if that platform is homegrown. But it is still monopolizing the market. So India created Aadhaar first. So the DPG stack is basically an identity stack. So basically a registry. Then you have a couple of other things. So there are five things that come together to create the bottom layer, which is the Aadhaar stack. On the Aadhaar stack, other protocols were launched. So the first big protocol that was launched was UPI. And think what UPI has done. Pre-UPI, 70% of the market was MasterCard and Visa. Today, 1.5%. Swift, out of India. You don't use Swift anymore. By the way, during the Vajpayee government, if we remember, US sanctioned India using Swift. Try doing that today. Swift has no place in India. UPI made India independent. Okay. Yeah. So we created that protocol there. Now on top of that, India is coming up with a transaction protocol, which is called ONDC. Now, intellectual side aside, let's understand how this works. A protocol basically has user side and a selling side, a demand side and a supply side. Now, on the internet, you have a browser where you go place the demand and a website where you go place the supply. On ONDC, instead of the browser, you have the buyer app. And instead of the website, you have the seller app. App is a misnomenclature. It can be any form factor. It can be a bridge. It can be a browser app plug-in, it can be a WhatsApp number, it can be anything. It's just called an app for the sake of calling an app. Name app is a nomenclature, missed nomenclature. So the point is, the most popular apps in your phone today, Uber, Swiggy, YouTube, WhatsApp, PhonePay, Google Pay, all these applications have millions of people daily using them. Yeah, absolutely. But you can't do everything on them. You can't buy any product or service on them. Each one of them is vertically specialized. Why? Because they are a platform, they have to go and acquire the supply and create the vertical platforms. ONDC says, you don't need to do that. If you're Uber, just create a window and anybody can come, buy any product or service in that app, but the supply is not in that app. So what happens? 
Just like on the browser, you type the website and all the websites show up. Here, you type the product that you want. That product search goes to every seller app in the country and every seller will show up. So imagine the power. Every single application in your pocket is a super app. Yeah. Every application can help you buy everything. So you could be in your banking application and buy an insurance for your mom, get a loan for your business, get a flight ticket to fly to Delhi, get a cup of tea or buy a jewelry for your wife or education for your children. Whatever you want to do from any app, you can do it. All apps are now super apps on the buy side. And on the sell side, these small shops, which don't like selling on platforms because what happens? 35 to 50% of them. You have to learn how to sell on five different applications. You have to spend a lot of money and effort. You get nothing in return, barely four orders a day. Success rate is 0.7%. 1,000 sellers registering, only seven are successful. So this means... I'm sorry, to interrupt. on which platform this statistic is coming from? Across platforms. Across, Across platforms. platforms. This is the success rate of online selling. Like when a bond online selling. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. So, nice. essentially, if you register on an online platform, your success rate is very low and your effort is very high. Result, nobody wants to do it. 2% of Indian sellers are digitized. You'll find yeah. them on Google, you'll not find what is there in the shop. Absolutely, that's absolutely sure. a fact. What is Auto NDC saying? Kuch nahi karna hai. Register yourself on one seller app, catalog wahan pe laga do, chipka do. You will be visible on all the buyers. So, you don't have to do anything. No marketing, no payment, no nothing. People can walk into your store, buy from you, and then you can tell them, scan my QR code. And when they scan your QR code, they will see you on whatever buyer app is there on their phone. There are many such modalities. We don't have enough time to go into it. Yeah. So this is the beauty on the buy side. Buy side, this is Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations coming true. Yeah. For the first time, there is universal discovery across every seller. Whatever is sitting in any shop, you can see on yeah. any app. Yeah. On the sell side, it's low effort, very high results, and very low percentage because you're giving 4-5%. Yeah. That's it. Instead of Amazon where you're giving 50%. So, the biggest beneficiary though are the large enterprises. Okay. Imagine this. I'll do a quick role-playing game. You're H12. I am ITC. Neither of us want to sell on Amazon or Flipkart. Yeah. My data goes to them. I have no control. Yeah. I can't control my business model. Absolutely. And they take a lot of cost from me. Mm -hmm. But my retail sales gives me no visibility because my visibility is only to the distributor. I don't know which retailer is selling what and which buyer is buying what. Like, I bet you've never gone to a HUL site to buy a shampoo. Yeah. You buy it from your Kirana and they have no visibility there. So both sides, they don't have control. What is ONDC giving them? ONDC is saying, hey, HUL, build your own seller app. Go get all the Kiranas on board on your app. Yeah. And connect them to ONDC. What just happened? You became, instead of a brand, a channel of sale for the Kirana. Yeah. Without any effort, because you're not bringing the buyers. You already have the sellers in your list. You're just bringing them in your app. They are getting connected to ONDC. Yeah. Here's the risk though. If you did it and I did not do it, I would lose the entire market. Yeah. So this is the first mover market. Okay. Now, do you know how many enterprises are building apps on ONDC today? No, I'm not aware of it. 16,000. Wow. Do you know how many are live? I am not aware of that fact as well. 80. 80. That little. And why is that? Because building an application on ONDC is incredibly complicated. It's like building your own payment gate. You can, okay. but you don't need to. It's too regulated, too compliance heavy. It changes very often. And these large companies have decent tech teams, but they're not optimized for building dynamic applications that are going to be the most cutting edge in the industry. No. So this is where they're getting stuck. ONDC is a complete game changer. The benefits of ONDC is immense. Problem is what? Problem is, ONDC is not able to take off because of the bottleneck due to technology. That people are not able to build the apps which are working well. Yeah. That's where we come in. What did we do? We created two things. Two problems, two solutions. The first one is something called Atma. Atma Nirbhar Technology Marketplace by Abhya. ONDC ka Atma. We got away with that. So, what we say is, you come in, choose which domain you are in. Retail, financial services, mobility, logistics. Choose which app you need. Buyer app, seller app, grievance app, financial reconciliation app, whatever apps you need. All these apps are done to the death. They're very well robust, very big. All the features, modules, all there. Choose that app. Choose which cloud you need. Google, Azure, AWS, choose. Choose the servers, the storage, etc. Okay. Click. Your app launches. Subscribe to NDC. Done. Go white label your app. Done. Take the APIs, plug it into your existing ERP, MDM, whatever you're using. Okay, good. Set the roles. Fine. 
you need integrations for email, SMS, WhatsApp. You need integrations for maps. You need integrations for various other things ready-made. Choose which partner you want and just switch it on. You need to go and set which features you want or modules you want. Essentially, we made the WordPress of this industry. You go launch your own app in less than a day. I can literally right now in front of you launch your app and you will be able to sell on ONDC tomorrow or take it to the market tomorrow. I can do it right now. That is how good Atma is. That is the problem statement number one. Unbottling the entire opportunity of ONDC. The second problem is if you're creating ONDC and you're creating these applications, what are you really doing? You're creating an operating system for Bharat. Yeah. And Bharat is not going to learn how to use new apps. Yeah. How can you make the apps intelligent enough that they can work with you instead of you learning to use the app? Generative AI. Okay. We launched our own GPT. Okay. We call it Vanij GPT. Vanij is multimodal. Voice, text and image. Multilingual. Many Indian languages. You go and tell it what you want. Yeah. I can simply go on Vanij right now and say, Mujhe aaj biryani khane ka man kar hai. Yeah. Ya mujhe bhook lagi hai, kuch khane ke liye dikhana. Ya main Delhi ja raho, ek flight ticket book karke dena. Ya mere last week ke order dikhana, Gupta ji ka cancellation manage kar lena. Mujhe shipping karke dena. Main aaj raat ko party pe ja raho, ek black shirt kharit ke dena. Main biryani bana raho, ingredients kharit ke dena. It's your imagination. You ask it, it'll do it for you. We launched this. This is basically Vanij and Atma. The combination is what is solving ONDC for enterprises. Okay, that's a great vision statement. But I have two follow-up questions. The first one is that a lot of people are saying that, you know, the reason ONDC is not taking off, you claim that it is because of the tech problems, right? Because it's hard to build for ONDC. But a lot of people say that the reason it's not taking off because these platforms that we, we spoke about earlier, they have invested a lot. For years, they have taken losses to build a habit. And that habit can't be built on ONDC because there is not going to be a single winner on ONDC. If there's not going to be a single winner, then there is not going to be a single loss taker as well. Okay, I'll answer this in three steps. Step one, right. ONDC is not homogeneous. ONDC right. is nothing. It's a protocol. You can build right. your own Amazon, your own Blinkit, your own ISTC, your own Make My Trip. Your own policy bazaar on ONDC, it's your choice. There's no limiting you. ONDC is a protocol. It is not a platform. A, remember this. Which means you can create whatever you want to create. I know people creating Blinkit on ONDC. I know people creating Amazon on ONDC. And I know people creating ISTC on ONDC. And I know Bangalore Metro is going on ONDC to enable people to buy metro tickets on ONDC. You can technically do anything on ONDC. It's a protocol to buy and sell. Okay, point number two. You know Paytm Wallet? Were you using Paytm Wallet at that point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know how many integrations and implementations it had and how much money it had? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. They had more than 100 integrations into different capabilities and God knows how much of an ecosystem. One year after UPI launched, Paytm Wallet almost went bankrupt. A platform is a finite play. Yeah. A protocol is an infinite play. Yeah. Which means if US invades Afghanistan, they have to get out at some point in time finite resources. Afghanistan doesn't need to get out. They are there forever. Infinite play. So finite versus infinite, infinite always wins. Every time. It doesn't matter how much resource the finite player brings in. Yeah. So today, we feel that these platforms like Amazon have invested so much money. What we are forgetting is ONDC is bringing in an infinite amount of people and players. Just to put things in perspective, Amazon is 7 lakh sellers. HUL is creating a seller app on ONDC bringing 12 lakh sellers. Yeah. Okay, one HUL covers 1.7x Amazon. Now imagine when HUL, ITC, etc. in the CPG world come in. Imagine when all the NBFCs come in to give loans. They've already started. About eight NBFCs are going live. All the insurance players, all the major banks, everybody's going live on ONDC with their own capability, with their own stack. All the major regulators are changing everything. Point number three, and this is the most critical point to remember. ONDC is better in every possible way from a platform. Which means that nobody has exclusivity. That's my question. For whom? It is better than a platform. But for whom? It's better for everybody. Better Every for the buyer. Better, okay. Yeah, better for the buyer. Better for the seller. Better for the platform. Better for the ecosystem. I'll explain. Except it is not good for two parties. It is not good for middlemen. Okay. It is absolutely terrible for middlemen. And it is absolutely terrible for the incumbents. These are the two parties who will vastly suffer unless they change their model. And many of them are already changing. 
Alex Pinto. Define incumbents. I'm sorry, incumbents means current online retailers. Incumbents means current market leaders. So in the world of airlines, there are GDS players who right. since the 1980s have been dominating the market. There are three major GDS players, right. local distribution systems, Amadeus, Spark, and there's one more, I'm forgetting the name. So GDS players, you can't book a flight ticket without going through the GDS. Right. All these make my trips, offline agents, the airlines are all plugged into GDS. GDS by force takes 3%. The only player in India to revolt against this GDS ecosystem was Indigo. And they right. created a new channel of distribution and they've kind of succeeded single-handedly. Now imagine an ONDC comes into that industry. There is no need of a GDS anymore. Okay. I talk about retail. Amazon takes 35 to 55% of your sales. Yeah. When the Kirana realizes or when the shop realizes that, dude, to come on page one, I have to pay 55%. I have to put in this much effort and I'm not getting much benefit versus on ONDC, I'm on one seller app and I become visible on every buyer app. Which one is more effective for me? For the sellers or for the consumers? Obviously, the answer is very clear. Okay. Now we come to the platforms. If I am anybody other than the incumbent. Right. See, platform economies create monopolistic economic cycles, which means that the more demand they have, the more supply they have, the more demand they have, the more supply they have. You can't stop it. You cannot prevent it. So, other than the top two, everybody else will never win. Think about Sugi and Zomato. A third player cannot win. Think about Uber and Ola. A third player has emerged but is never going to be able to get to that number because the market is controlled by the top two players. Right. Uh, look at Amazon and Flipkart. Third player exists, but imagine the distance between them. It doesn't work in the real world though. Even if Maruti is 13% or 17% of the market and Kia is 4% of the market, Maruti can't prevent Kia from being sold. Right. Because platforms have inherent network effects. The reason yes. platforms result in the monopolistic behavior and why history has shown that majority of the times duopoly in the platform exists, the reason behind is, is that they have network effects associated with them. They did. Yes. Why, why are we on Swiggy? Because every food seller is on the Swiggy. Why every food seller is on Swiggy? Because every food buyer is on Swiggy. Now, this is what my follow-up question was. That's what I'm answering you. Right. That's exactly what I'm answering you. Hear me right. right now. Every seller goes on Swiggy because all the buyers are on Swiggy. Right. Okay. Tomorrow, there are three dozen buyer apps in ONDC. Google Pay, Paytm, Phone Pay, Magic right. Pin, Uber, Ola. Do you know the combined number of buyers on these apps? I don't. Okay. Let's forget the actual number. Right. Is it a lot more than Swiggy? I guess so. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot more than Swiggy. It may be right. 10 times more than Swiggy. Yeah. Okay. Now that restaurant has been forced to work with Swiggy, giving Swiggy 25-30% of yeah. their revenue share because they didn't have an option. Yeah. There was no other platform through which they could get those buyers. Yeah. Now comes ONDC and ONDC says, list on any seller app and your buyers will be coming from all these buyer apps, which means your orders are still justified. You're going to get, in fact, more orders and pay one-sixth the amount. Where will we go? Right. So as a seller and as a buyer... There is no <laughs> iota, of doubt, iota of doubt that it is better for us. My but question... extrapolate that, no. Extrapolate that. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. Extrapolate that. Seller nikal jayega to sugi mein rahega kya? Right. No, that's fine. But the question was, these platforms are powerful because of two things. They changed the habit. And they did that yeah. by taking huge losses initially on the yeah. investor's money, saying to them that, dude, sure, we are taking a loss right now, but we will become platform later on. We'll have the network effect and then we can recoup yes. those losses, right? That's why it's okay for us to uh, finish losses right now. And it's the habit. But as the initial question was that because ONDC is democratizing transactions, so every app can become a super app. Yes. So how would the existing platform or the new platform they are going to come in how will they face humongous losses because nobody will back them because they will say, even if you face losses, there is no guarantee that ultimately you will be able to recoup those losses. So new platforms won't okay. be able to get there. Okay, so your question is not whether ONDC will succeed. Your question is, why will people create new platforms on ONDC? Yeah, exactly. ONDC should exist. Like if you want my honest opinion, I think it should exist. My question is, why an existing company would invest building an app on ONDC when it knows that whatever the tech stack I'm building, whatever the efforts I'm putting in, later on, somebody else can do the same? No, I got your question. I right. got your question. So, you need to understand two fundamental things here. 
and then I'll talk about the third fundamental thing. But first, the two fundamental things. One, right? It's a first mover market. Why? You remember the role play we did? I'll do that again. You're right. actual. I am ITC. How many Kiranas are there in the market? Twenty-five lakh. How many right. of them are grade A GTs? The ones that do most of the sales, two lakh. You right. go to market. I don't go to market. Right. I don't create the app. You do create that. You capture those two lakh grade A and maybe another ten lakh GTs. I wake up after two years. I go to market. Not a single one of those Kiranas will move from your app to my app. Okay. Think about it this way. I'll give you another example. It will become crystal clear. Do you have Google Pay in your pocket right now? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. So if I come to you with a new UPI app, will you shift? Yeah, I don't really mind doing that. I understand. Like you know, there is a slight hesitance to there, but not hesitance. There's no new value. There is no new value no. that you would be able to offer because what's going to happen is that you can't offer uh, discounts like platforms because no, no, you can offer discounts. Sorry, no, no, no that 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 makes sense. You no. can offer discount, but it won't be economically viable to offer huge discounts initially. No, no, people are offering huge discounts. That is not what I'm saying. Right. Discounts is immaterial in this aspect. All I'm saying is, if HL created that application and got those Kiranas on board. The only possible way that ITC could wean off those Kiranas into their own app, because let's be clear, no Kirana will run two apps. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because if you're on one app, you get visibility into every buyer app. Right. So if you're on two apps, you don't get double the visibility. You still get the same visibility. So why would you do two apps? There are no two advantages. So you run one app. Right. Something like UPI. So if Google Pay is already there in your pocket, and I come to you with a new UPI app. You don't shift because there's no new value I can give you. So the only way, if HL created that application, ITC would be able to wean off them is if ITC offered incredible discounts right. to those sellers for a sustained period of time, which would be heavily loss making. Right. So this means that ONDC or any protocol, by the way, any protocol, right. not just ONDC, internet itself is always a first mover market, and it's not going to be one winner. There's going to be multiple winners in every category, in every domain. But nevertheless, it is going to be first mover. The ones who go first, like in UPI, it is Google Pay, Phone Pay, Paytm, etc., who went first. Mm -hmm. Banks went much later. They have the same UPI app. Nobody uses them. So the point is, if the first players create those apps and they acquire the sellers or the buyers, depending on whether they're seller app or buyer app, you're not going to be able to wean them off later, unless you give right. incredible discounts for a sustained period of time. I mean, what else is there? The whole benefit comes from ONDC as a protocol. Right. The value proposition is not the app. See, think of it this way: Amazon's value proposition is the total supply and demand they've aggregated. Right. On ONDC, you're one side only. So even if you have the demand, you can't tell that demand that I have supply here, special deals here. There's none. Right. And even if you have the supply, like you have all the sellers, you can't tell them I have demand here. Right. You can't connect them. So the result is there are thousands and thousands of companies who have come to the same conclusion that if I don't build an app on ONDC, I'm going to lose my market forever. Okay. So they're all trying to create that application on ONDC now, and you are helping them in do that. Yeah, we are doing that. But I'll answer another part of your question now. You had said that the growth of ONDC is because of so and so. I'll give you the. It has been claimed. The growth. I'm not saying it. It has been claimed that why that is. Yes, I'll, that's because of a suboptimal understanding of how the protocol works. Maybe the fact of the matter is that today ONDC has grown five thousand times. Right. From March twenty three when they were doing. A hundred orders a day to today when they're doing three lakh orders a day, right? Okay, that's how fast ONDC has grown in this period. Not just that, ONDC has introduced new domains. Some of the applications that are coming are bringing. So there are today four applications that do more than ten thousand orders a day. Seven applications that do more than one thousand orders a day. So you realize four applications with ten thousand is forty thousand. Seven applications with one thousand is seven thousand. Forty-seven thousand orders a day, but ONDC is doing three lakh orders a day. Where is the rest of the orders coming from? The vast other applications are also doing orders, even if they're not doing thousands of orders a day. So the point is, ONDC is growing phenomenally fast because it's a protocol that's enabling everybody to do what they want to do. Exactly. You build your own apps. The real bottleneck to ONDC is not the fact that existing platforms are better. You can do everything you can do on an Amazon on ONDC. There's no such difference. Nothing. Quality assurance would be a factor. So, no, like, not. Like, imagine this. So I am buying on ONDC. It's like a Kirana store, right? I go there, I buy it. I don't like the performance of the Kirana. I can give it a negative review, right? I can say that guy is a thief, or you know, I can do whatever. But there's no redressal mechanism beyond that. No, but I think you're wrong. There is, right? Okay, what's that? 
Okay, so whenever a protocol like this comes in, they come in with grievance redressal protocols, finance management protocols, where systemic changes are made, not at a platform level. Right. See, Avi, you and I are used to thinking app level changes. Right. These guys are not making app level changes. They're making RBI, SIDBI, IDI level right. changes. So RBI and the banking system has come up with a new banking network, right. which means that there's a new kind of bank account you have to open. No, no, we are talking and about the problem. We are pro problem. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm answering. So there's a new kind of bank account that you have to open. There's a new kind of settlement process that you have to follow, which means yeah. A, supposing you bought something from a Kirana through ONDC, who holds the money? The money doesn't go to the Kirana. Yeah. The money may be sitting in your buyer apps nodal account. They right. can't touch it either. So if you raised a grievance, there's a grievance redressal protocol, which has SLAs baked into it, which will immediately go to the seller. And if the seller doesn't resolve it, money goes back to you. Although well, the thing is, when the disputes are crystal black and white, then obviously, you know, it's easy to resolve the dispute. When it's grave, imagine this, I bought half liter of milk on ONDC, right? Somebody delivered to me. One day has passed. And now I try to boil the milk. The milk turns sour. I raise a dispute whether the money is within the seller's account, wherever the money is. Now the seller says that I don't know what you guys did at back home. I have sold milk to hundreds of people. Nobody complained. I don't know. Maybe your utensil was dirty. Absolutely. Maybe, right. And this guy is saying everything is fine. I don't know. These guys have given me sour milk. So how do you yeah. de decide this dispute? Like imagine this, yeah, this so, is like a very no, typical no, scenario. Part of right? The... right now, if I'm on ONDC, who will decide this dispute? Okay. So again, you're imagining that there is an underlying entity that needs to. First of all, I'm not uh, imagining that. I'm I'm not. I'm just telling you. I I no, don't I, know how it should be resolved. I'm asking it right now. You are claiming that dispute resolution is inherently baked into the ONDC protocol. I'm telling right. you the gradations. So the right. stages of right. issue management. So the first thing when you raise that complaint goes to the buyer. Okay. Now there were rules in that order when you placed it that milk when you bought it was not cancelable, not returnable. Absolutely. To begin with. So the buyer will cancel your request and it will not even go to the seller. Right. Now, instead of milk, had you bought... Uh... No, no, I'm just talking about milk. Let, let's just talk about milk. Okay. So, uh, seller cancels it, right? Seller says that milk is uncancelable. Seller says that milk is uncancelable. Right. So, it's not. At the end of the day, it's not going to As a consumer, it's not going to be. Yeah, that's the case. Yeah. Imagine this if I do this on Amazon. Imagine this. No, wait. Imagine no, 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 no. no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're getting ahead of Amazon. Amazon. Wait, let me explain. For that matter. What no, no, let me blink it. There. Yeah. No, no, forget blink it. Those ecosystems are built in a way that sellers take the loss. That is not equitable. Absolutely. That is not equitable. See, is it equitable? I agree with you. They are not equitable, right? And that's not that, right. That's, that's true. Right? I'm not arguing on that. My question was, why would a company whom you are selling, right, essentially, why would they spend money on building an OLBC app? That's the question. That's Wait the on. question. Before we get there, right. no, no, you, you've not let me finish the grievance protocol. Okay, okay. There are levels to the grievance protocol which we've not discussed. Mm -hmm. So first thing is, let's say it's milk. And when you bought the product, you agreed. Bold milk kawata, it is not returnable cancelable. So you took the risk. Okay. You took the risk knowing that it is not returnable. It's your call. You cannot go back and say, sorry, there was a fraud. There was none. You got your product. If it wasn't delivered to you, then yes, you would get your money back. But it was delivered to you. Proof of delivery is there. Yes. And you took a product that was not returnable or not cancelable. So you can't. Now let's imagine you did buy a product that was returnable and cancelable. No, and I'm, 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 you're talking about the hierarchy of the dispute. Is the right. So your question is, in the case of milk, the question that I raised, mm -hmm. I just wanted to show you the stark difference between the quality control. You said that why people would still stick to platforms instead of going on ONDC. Like, yeah. that's how we start the This is one of the points that I'm raising. Because no, all I these platforms are taking huge losses, because these platforms are making money out of it, they are incentivized to give you a good experience. But in ONDC, because there is no centralized platform which is making money out of it. So nobody is responsible for making sure no, that that's completely quality. wrong. Right. No, no, that is completely wrong. The buyer app is making money out of it and the seller app is making money out of it. Only thing is the buyer app protects the buyers and the seller app protects the sellers. This is not right. Each party has their own customer support team and their own grievance management systems in place. So right. with their own SLAs in place. And if the two parties can't agree, there is an ODR level, an online dispute resolution level. 
So ONDC has put in place eight different companies who are ODRs. So if the disputes come up, the ODRs handle it. See, till today, the fill rate on ONDC is 97%. But the dispute rate on ONDC is less than 1%. Right. You understand this? The fill rate on ONDC is 97%. Okay. The dispute rate on ONDC is 1%. This is not comparable to any existing platform. Existing platform may fill rates are lower than 90% and dispute rates are more than 10%. Here, it is better. I'm trying to explain that to you from the beginning. Think of it this way. Buy up, take percentages. Buy up, 2-3% take percentages. Seller, 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 seller will take 2-3%. Do, do, do seller, no. Seller, seller, app. Seller, app. Right. Yeah. Seller, app. Seller, app. Will take 2-3%, two, 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 right? Tomorrow, I'll come in because the demand has been... Buying I would say, I would not take 2-3%. Two, two, I'll take 1%. And that's why I incentivize the seller on these platforms to switch to my app. And then again, if my thing is that the lesser money I make, the lesser commission I make, the more sellers will onboard me, why I would be incentivized to provide the good quality of service? Okay. So, we've actually got confused between yeah. levels of the question. We need no, no, to handle question. this. So my question is essentially the same. Why companies would want to spend money to build an ONDC app? Okay, okay. So I that, to get back to that question. Person, three person, tomorrow, nobody is stopping another company to come in and say, okay, I will not take two to three person, I'll take one person. Use my app instead. And a seller, if you're a seller, you are incentivized. Now you're saying that, you know, okay, I'm just making 1% out of it. Like, this is my confusion. Now, allow me to unbundle this question because you basically taken three different elements and combined them and which is why the confusion. First right. of all, the buyer apps take care of the buyer side and they take a commission on the buy side. Okay. And that commission can come separately from the buyer or it can come from the seller is doing. Yeah. Okay. Logistics can be paid by the buyer. All logistics can be paid by the seller. Right. The second point is, when it comes to something like ONDC, there are gradations of grievance management. Our right. parties are mandatorily required to maintain that grievance management process. It is not optional for them to do it. Right. Okay. This is a part of the protocol that you have to have the grievance management automation. You have to have the staff to manage the grievances and you have to follow to keep it up to the grievance management SLAs. If you don't do it, ONDC will bar you which means you will not be a seller app on ONDC. So your quality assurance from that level, ONDC ensures. Now we come to the third level. At this level, we need to understand that different companies are building applications on ONDC for different reasons. But the primary two triggers, and you are again and again coming from the revenue generation trigger, it's not necessarily revenue generation. The primary trigger to build an application on ONDC is loss prevention. For most of these large enterprises, they have existing ecosystems. Think of it as a bank first. I'll give you four examples. Think of each one of them. Yeah. You're a bank. You have two crore people coming to your banking app every day. If you open up an ONDC buyer app in that, they can buy. Now, it would be a bad decision if no other bank did it. Then you also don't do it. But you don't exist in isolation. All these people also have other bank accounts. And if you didn't do it and another bank did it, all the transactions would flow through whichever bank offered it. So as a result, in order to prevent their users from slipping away to somebody else, they're all offering ONDC in their application. Max. Now we come to CPG companies like HUL, Coca-Cola, Nestle. They realize that if they don't go and acquire the Kiranas and they don't offer the solution, the Kiranas would go to their competitors' apps and they would lose the Kiranas. Take it to another one, the fintech companies. Same reason. This all boils down to loss prevention for the larger companies. That, okay, I'm going to basically offer ONDC in my application. I'm going to let everybody connect to ONDC and sell. I get three benefits. I get the data. I get to understand who's selling what, how much is selling, whatever. Two, I get to sell allied capabilities. So a bank gets to do credit, etc. CPGs get to do sourcing, force their brands or encourage people to buy their brands more than the competitor, etc. And third, obviously revenue generation. Because even if it is 2%, it's 2% more than what I had. Right. Because as HUL, I wasn't getting that 2% to begin with. As Canada Bank, I wasn't getting that 2% to begin with. But now I will. Okay. okay. So the reason why people are building these applications, by the way, the protocols are in place. Protections are in place. The right. user cannot be defrauded. There is a single rating for sellers across all apps, which yeah. means if a seller does something, the rating goes down and if they do a fraud, they'll be banned from ONDC, which means they can't sell on any app. Imagine a connected ecosystem of applications where you don't need to go and create your rating separately on each app, etc. And third, your grievance management is being taken care of by the buyer for the buyer, seller for the sellers. 
Now, if the buyer said you can't get a return on that milk, that's your problem. You have to wake up to the new reality that this is not Amazon. You are not going to get a return on something you should not get a return on. Sure, that's a bad experience for that little bit. But what are you really benefiting from? You're benefiting from the fact that your purchases could be hyper-local. You could go to Guptaji's shop and pick it up or give it back to Guptaji and Guptaji could take it back because he knows you. So remember this, 90%, 9 out of 10 purchases in India are not e-commerce. They're retail. They're recurring purchases you purchase any which way from people. And when it comes to services, it's much higher. So all these are still ONDC. ONDC is not e-commerce. Absolutely not e-commerce. ONDC captures physical, retail, digital, B2B, all of that. And brings in all these value propositions. So sellers adopt because they get to sell everywhere. They get credit. They get everything. Buyers buy because they get universal discovery. They get to see Baji mein kiske paas se order kar diya phone pe. Baaki ja ke utha liya. There are many convenience benefits you get. It's a mix of all the benefits you've seen so far. And none of the losses. Okay. Sure. So I would not go into detail of that because, you know, we are running out of time and we have the series of the questions. So my next question would be that building a startup is never easy. Be it is a billion dollar company or is be a very small company. What's the hardest part of entrepreneurship in your opinion? It's a lonely journey. That's basically the hardest part. Okay. Nobody understands what you're going through. There are people sure who will come and try to support you. Some will give you money. Your family will try to support you. But at the end of the day, it's you. And you succeed or you fail and your business succeeds or it fails depending on you. My last business failed because of me. My current business succeeded because of me. And win or lose, it's you. Yeah. So it's a very, very lonely journey. So do you have co-founders in your I do. business? I do. Some people say that co-founders are absolute essential. If you don't have a co-founder, don't even start a start. What are your thoughts? It depends on the person. Okay. I think there are people out there who can very well run everything by themselves. The reason mm -hmm. why you typically need co-founders is two things. One, investors refuse to believe that one person can be a subject matter expert in multiple domains. So you know finance, you know tech, you know sales, you know marketing. Yeah, that doesn't normally happen. So that's one reason. And the second reason is exactly this, that you genuinely don't know. And because you don't know, you bring in subject matter experts who complement each other. So yeah. you bring in somebody who knows how to code, they become the CTO. Somebody who knows how to sell, they become the CEO. And somebody who knows how to manage the operations, they become the CEO. So this is typically why you need two to three founders. But the real answer is, there are exceptions out there yeah. where there are people who know all of it. And for them, co-founders are not necessarily as much of a force multiplier as it is for other people. Yeah. You still benefit from having co-founders because you can confide in them. They can support you when times are tough, etc. So you do need that. But you don't need them for performance as much as you would need if you didn't know everything yourself. Yeah. So what's the final answer? How important are co-founders? No, there is no real answer. Because co -founders, right it depends there's, upon the person. There's no right answer. Depends on the person. So if you are someone like me who's basically done the tech, done the sales, right. uh, done the marketing, you probably may feel, if you're arrogant enough, that you don't need a co-founder. But right. that'd be a stupid decision because you would also make all the mistakes yourself and have nobody to hold you back. Right. That's a fact of the matter because, see, here's how it works in my company. I move very fast. My other co-founder, Angad, also moves equally fast. I do the tech, I do the sales, etc. Angad handles the business. But the person who holds us back is Archana. Now, at times, it's very frustrating that Archana is telling us not to do something when we can clearly see that it's the right thing to do. But seven days later, it suddenly becomes clear to us that, thank God, she held us back. Yeah. And it's happened God knows how many times that I've come to realize that had it not been for Archana, my hubris would have led me down to a path which would have killed the company. Yeah. So, you know, you get that Elon Musk syndrome. You get that pros and cons, right? According to you, it depends upon the person to person. No, no. According to me, you should have co-founders. So, but you the benefit depends on how you are. Okay, got it. Now, you know, there's a very controversial topic that I wanted to explore is on the founder's equity. Obviously, we don't want to know what's the scene in your startup. I'm talking in general. So, one school of thought is that it should be equally split, right? Because, you know... Never. Okay. So you don't no. come to that school of thought. So, no, I don't. so according to you, what is the best way to split founder equity? Look, business is not socialism. Business is driven by value. Capitalism at the end of the day. You get what you bring to the table. Yeah. If I have some massive rich person coming to the table to become my co-founder who's bringing all the money in the beginning, dude, he'll own majority of the equity. 
if I am bringing all the technology and all the sales, well, then I could probably equate with him. Right. So I have to bring something which is equal to him. If I'm more than him, then I get more equity than him. That's A and B is negotiation part. If you're good at negotiating, you'll get a better equity. That's uh, true in anything in life. So I think there are these equity calculators which are there. And uh, one thing which I do when I start a new business is I sit down with my co-founders. I forget all the equity calculators and I tell them that, look, put in writing what you bring to the table first. Right. And why you are there as a co-founder. So we do that honest exercise. Then we judge each other. Right. Very brutally judge each other. And we say, okay, you don't actually bring this to the table. So why the hell are you, you know, saying that you do this? You don't. In fact, I do this better than you. And after that half an hour, one hour of fight, things settle down. And then we really know who brings what. A. B, then I say, write down the amount of equity each one of us should have. Right. So each of the three of us will write down the equity each one of us should have. Yeah. You know what ends up happening? What? Each party tends to slightly overvalue themselves and undervalue the other, but not by much. So when you take a blended average of the three, you end up with an equity distribution which is better than any calculator can achieve. That's a great idea. And one follow-up question to that, what is the best time to have this discussion? Is it before you start or is it after a couple of months have passed, you have worked together? Because initially it's not very clear, especially when you start a new business, what kind of roles you would be bringing? What is the requirement of the business? What kind of business it would be? Because at that time, to be honest, we're still trying to figure out the product market fit. Always and always, it is better to do it at the beginning before you start because you don't want to leave these things to chance because once it takes off, for yeah. you know, people won't agree at all. And so you just manage to create a successful business and destroy it at the same time. So agree on it beforehand and then if things turn out different and somebody brings a lot more value to the table than you had initially imagined, have that negotiation again. That's fine. Okay. Have that negotiation again, but don't leave it to chance. See, what happens is supposing I agreed that you and I and a third person started a business, the third person is 15%, you are 25%, and I'm 60%. Let's assume. Yeah. A couple of months down the line, it turns out you're bringing more value than me on the table. You yeah. come and say, why the hell should you get 60%? You should get 30% and I should get 40%. And we'll have that negotiation and redo that exercise I just said. And for all you know, we'll arrive at that number. And that's okay. But you will have all the leverage at that time, right? Because I won't. Because it's a two-month-old company. It's a right. two-month-old company. You walk away, the company's dead and you can always start again. And you know by now that you bring the value. Right. You realize? Intrinsically, Avi knows that Avi is more valuable than Shayek in that equation. Shayek knows that too. So if Avi says you don't agree to a blended average again, I'm walking away and starting on my own. Or what will Shaikh do? Right. No, you can have a non-compete clause in the founder's agreement, but like that's besides the point. Uh, very difficult to implement. Very difficult. Very difficult to implement. Especially in India. I know. Being a lawyer, trust me, I, I understand how difficult it is. And I won't even advise someone to do that. My next question is that you have been quite successful at startup accelerators or incubators. You have been selected by Alchemist. You have been selected by Techstars. My first question would be, people who are applying to these, you know, we have listeners, entrepreneurs who are applying to these, how to get selected? What is the best way to get selected to these incubators? I think having some proof of success yeah, and having thought through the business model, the theses, the success criteria, having a settled team, these help. But at the end of the day, let's understand that when an accelerator or an incubator doesn't select you, it's probably not because of you. Okay. It's probably because they have a vested reason to take certain kinds of companies. Because at the end of the day, accelerators are also running a business. And who they select is because of what they want to do with those companies they select. Just like when a VC doesn't invest in you, doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad company. It just means that the VC knows that there's another company they can sell to a senior VC and exit. Yeah. And so you may be a better business, but you may not be sellable to the senior VC to whom they are a feeder. So they will not invest in you. That doesn't tell you that you're not a better business. And when we start understanding these things, we start understanding that, hey, accelerators are essentially like MBAs. Yeah. They could be good if you come from nowhere. But if you already know the business, then they're not a great thing to go to. None of the accelerators, not even by Combinator, are a very good place to go to if you already know what you're doing. I accept one thing. Accelerators give you network. So if you want that network, then by all means, if you don't have the network. Like I first did Alchemist and then I did Techstars exactly because of that, because I wanted to expand the business to US and I became a part to get access to the US network. I had no network in US. Alchemist, unfortunately, was virtual, so I couldn't access the network. 
I did whatever little I could, but I was so busy keeping the company afloat and in India in working hours yeah. that in middle of the night trying to get to talk to people in US never happened. And then when I did tech stars, I was in US, so I did manage to create a very successful network, and that network helped me to raise one and a half million dollars. Wow! So I raised the money in US. So that's the only reason you want to go to an accelerator. You don't want to go to an accelerator if you already know how to run a business. But there is nuances here. You may think you know how to run a business, but practically speaking, you may not know how to run that OKR, how to run the legalities, how to do a term sheet. You may not know how to do the ESOP plans for your employees. There's so much in running a startup that you don't know. That's best to go to an accelerator. There are templates for this. Yeah. But let's also be honest. You can ask ChatGPT, and it that will give you the same template. And give you the same guidance. You can literally ask ChatGPT to be a mentor, and it will do it because that information has been documented. So accelerators are not necessarily as beneficial as they used to be. Wow, great words there. And you know, you brought in the concept of legalities, ESOP, and you know, so many things. So, what's the most challenging legal aspect of running a business, especially when you're sitting here in India and you're trying to enter a foreign markets? Two parts to that answer. First, the legality problem in India is if you're a you know seasoned founder and you've been through this, it's not a challenge. You could do it without a lawyer. Do yeah. about ninety ninety five percent of the cases. There are use cases like M and A, larger syndicates, etc., where you will still need a lawyer to guide you. But beyond that, your normal contracts, your normal ESOPs, your normal everything, you can draft it yourself. Of the net, you know you know what to check for. You know how to be careful. You can do it yourself. Like I could draft a normal SHA myself. That's not a big deal for me. But if you're not a seasoned founder and you haven't gone through dozens of these legal documents, it's best to use a lawyer who will guide you and also use a lawyer who's not a black box who will tell you ki kya karna kya nahi. So that later on you can do it yourself if need be. Yeah. And the second part of this is the cross border part of it depends on which geography. Singapore is easy. Europe is more complicated. China is hella complicated. Yeah. And because I've set up companies in all these countries, so I do know. But the most complicated in my experience is US. Okay. And without a shadow of a doubt, you need a lawyer. You cannot do it at all without a lawyer because US is so legal, so legal that you make one mistake and you'll be sued for millions of dollars. No, so that's quite true. The founders that I have in the US and the founder friends that I have in the India, the legal concern among them is like you know, there's a well, yeah, US is legal first, right? US is legal first, India is legal last. In right. me, it's like, I know Avi, Avi se baat kar lunga, it'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. US, US mein, I tried talking to Avi, Avi uses that as evidence against me. Yeah, against you. Right. In India, the founders are only afraid of section 138 in the Negotiable Instrument Act. If their check is bounced, they, they can be jailed for that. That's one of the concerns they have. Other than that, they are not worried about anything. Like over their discrimination, yeah. they are worried about. When you fire somebody right. and that person takes you to court. You hire somebody and that person takes you to court for discrimination because you hired them. Right. You won't believe I have a friend, founder friend, who have been sued because that person asked personal questions to the interviewer. Oh, yeah, I had a US yes. founder who prevented me from doing that. Right. I hired in India and I started asking that, okay, who's there in your family? And, yeah. uh, you know, what do you do and all? And he immediately stopped me. He was a US co-founder. He said, Levi. Levi immediately put me on mute and said, you're never going to ask that question again. Right. You will end up in court if you do that. You can't ask what their last salary was. You can't ask why they're joining this job. You can't ask anything. So it's a very legal country, very legal country. Like literally, if you hired somebody, yeah. you know how funny this is, you hire somebody and that person can take you to court saying you hired me because you discriminated against me. Yeah. See the counterintuitive logic? I just hired you because I liked you. I think you can do the job. No. You hired me because you discriminated against me because I am so-and-so gender. Oh, yeah, it is quite complicated. As we're running out of time, I have time for one more question. What is the best piece of professional advice you have heard in your life? Wow, best piece of professional advice. Oh, yeah, Matt Coe's law. Yeah, I guess that's the best piece of advice. I didn't recognize it at the time. So Matt Coe's law, uh, managing director of Techstars, he told me that, Shayat, you've done everything right except one. And I said, what? He said, you've not sold. And he said, sell, sell and sell. Spend all your time selling. You're a great sales guy. Why the hell are you not selling? Why are you not out in the market? Why are you not traveling everywhere from Kansas to Denver to Dallas to Austin to San Francisco selling? Why are you sitting at home and writing emails? Why are you doing cold calls? Why are you reaching out through third parties? 
you should be there in front of the customer understanding why he's not buying. And you should be the one selling. I said, sell, sell and sell. And I thought, you know, I don't have the money to do all that. So I'm going to do the cold calling thing. It works. Because it does work in India. Best piece of advice ever. Because a founder needs to know how to sell. And in my current company, I was talking to Matt the other day. In fact, I'm going to California uh, next week. So I'll be meeting Matt again. I'm going to pay homage to him. I'm going to tell him that, look, you said sell. And in this company, I'm the only sales guy. Yeah. No, that's really true. In the initial days, founders have to be the person who's selling. You can't delegate this function. And uh, as much possible, try to have the personal meetings. I understand that cost consideration, geography consideration, you may not be able to do that. I thought that, you know, after COVID, things would change. But I was wrong. I have recently learned this myself. The impact that a personal meeting can have far outweighs what you can do over Zoom. So if the cost permits, if the business model permits, travel. If the cost always permits, no, no, Abhi, the cost always permits. It's a misnomer. You can spend 5,000 rupees to go to a city, meet someone, because you're going to get two benefits. A, they're going to reject you and you're going to learn why. Or yeah. B, they're going to select you and you're going to learn why. You will get two benefits. So go there, meet people. If I open my calendar and share my screen right now, this week alone, I've been in Delhi and Bangalore. And now I'm sitting in Bombay. This week alone. I went to Delhi to meet a few customers. Then I went to Bangalore. The whole day meeting with the whole Google team, etc. So the point is, go. Okay, this is not confidential, so I can tell you. I went to the Google meeting for just one simple showcase. It yeah. was supposed to be over in 45 minutes. My showcase part was only 10 minutes. The whole thing was 45 minutes. It got over. The lady who was coordinating it got interested. She called me to the cafeteria. We had lunch together. She called her boss who sat with me saw what I was doing, got interested, called the head of sales, who saw what I was doing, got interested, called all the different HODs, got interested. See where this is going? In one day. Just one day. And this would have never happened if you would have tried to do this over Zoom. Never. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Chayak, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. It was really entertaining and enlightening. We got to learn so much about your business. Best of luck for your business. We hope you succeed and do great things for India. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Yes Users podcast. Remember, at Yes Users, we interview established co-founders so that you can learn from their experience and journey. And hey, if you know someone who would be an amazing guest on our show, drop us a comment. We are always on a lookout for fascinating individuals to feature. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning and keep listening to your users. Catch you in the next episode.